Here's the key on this. Don't major in minor things. If you take up major time to do minor things, I'm telling you, you'll be behind the curve constantly. Here's what we learn in sales training. What's major time and what's minor time? Here's minor time, thinking about prospects. Here's minor time, making lists of prospects. Here's minor time, keeping books on prospects. Here's minor time, going to see the prospect. Here's minor time, evaluating the prospect after you've been there. That's all minor time. Here's major time, in the presence of the prospect. That's, min that's major time. And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff in the presence of. How many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of the prospect. Majors and minors. Here's another key time management essential. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question, doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, going, going and they're doing figure eights. Their progress is small. So don't mistake movement for achievement. Here's another one in sales we learned. Don't mistake courtesy for consent. If somebody's pleasant and they nod, you say, oh, they're going to buy. No, they're courteous. You can't mistake courtesy for consent. Now here's a big one, concentration. I had to learn this. All those years ago, I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter. Found it turns out to be a strange letter. So here's what I learned to do. Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. I found this to be helpful. Concentration. Here's another big one. Learn to say no. I'm telling you in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you should said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit, overcommit yourself. My friend Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. It's a good one. Now here's a big one on time management. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that. Or at the beach, I'm saying I should be at the office, I should be at the office. Now my family's upset because I'm at the beach and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now when I'm at the office, I'm thinking what? I got to get my family to the beach, the beach, the beach. So things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach and things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach, be at the beach. At the office, be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Now here's one of the most important ones. Don't play at work. Work is too serious. You don't want the reputation of being the office joker. It's not a good one. Yes, there's time for some pleasant stories. Yes, there's time for a little humor. Yes, uh, best if it's a happy office, of course. But I'm telling you, you gotta be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called, serious business. Not grim, not unhappy, but serious. Key. Don't play at work. 
The old expression, I don't think we use it anymore, horse around at the office. Play around, play jokes, play tricks. No place, not at the workplace. At the beach, yes. At the bar, yes. Somewhere else, not work. You got to treat work with all due conservative passion. Because it's leading you to your future. Here's another key phrase, all work is good. You may not like your job, but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to, to go, you've got to appreciate your job. You don't have to have a passion for your job. Here's the ultimate passion, a passion for incredible success in every department of my life. That's the passion. But don't look down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial, menial. No job is not, no, every job is noble. Training life for pay, making a contribution to society. Next, analyze how you are. And if you have some weaknesses, if you can't, doesn't seem like you can change, here's the key, get it covered. I used to keep promising myself I'd keep the books, keep the books, keep the books. Finally, I gave that up. And back then it only took me an extra 50, 60 bucks a month for some accountant to keep the books. I said, no, I'm going to save the 50 bucks. You can't believe what I started losing in productivity because I tried to save the 50 bucks. So the key is a lot of the time you can stay like you are, but just make sure you get it covered. Okay. Next, beware of the telephone and all other systems of communication, especially the telephone at home and systems of communication at home. And here's one of the best lines I've got for you for the weekend. Let all communication systems serve you, but don't let them intrude. When it comes time to have dinner with your family, you shut off all systems. Unless the ones that can take messages silently. Don't let the phone ring. Don't let anybody intrude. Come through the front door, nor the back door, nor through the telephone or any other device. So you can't reach John and his family when he's having dinner. The President of the United States couldn't get through. If you develop that kind of a reputation, father, mother, when we have dinner, when we're visiting and have this time with our family, nothing intrudes. So don't let these clever little devices keep intruding. You've got to have a place that's sacrosanct, it's, it's valuable. You don't let anything in for that period of time. Okay. Isn't that good advice? Excellent advice. Here's the next one. Read all the books. You know, I've only got a few notes here on time management, but if you've got some particular challenges, you run a big organization, a big corporation, you've got some challenges, there's plenty of books. Now, here's what's next. Just be more alert to the things that might be stealing your time. Here's why, time is like capital. You can't let someone steal your seed corn, you can't let someone steal your capital, and you can't let someone steal your time. You must designate your time, and some of the time that you designate, you must not let anyone steal. Casual time, you might let someone intrude and steal a little bit and take a little bit, but not serious time. Next, one of the great time management savers is to learn to ask questions up front. Sometimes you talk to somebody for an hour and then you ask questions and find out if you would have asked those questions up front, you could have saved yourself an hour. Asking questions up front helps you to get to the problem now. But if you just launch into some discourse, you might waste 30 minutes, waste an hour, when here's what you should have been talking about. After you finished an hour, you say, John, what's really the problem? He said, well, it's something personal. See, that's what you should have been talking about this whole hour. Key. Next, learn to think on paper. Now we're going to take a break. Some ways to think on paper. One, we've covered one. Solving problems. Take it out of your head and put it on paper. 
Another one is setting goals. Making these lists we've already started. Here's another good way to think on paper. It's a projects book. Each person you're working with and each project you're working on, get a loose leaf binder and a tab and some pieces of paper behind the tab and do a little continual summary of how it's going between you and that person and between you and that project. I call it a projects book. It is so useful to me. But what's going on between you and this person? When you last got together, what did you talk about? And you got a few notes there. Here's what we talked about the last time we got together. Now when you get together again, you can review that so you'll know better what to talk about. When the president gets ready to travel and he's going to meet some important people, guess what they bring him? All these briefing books. Right? The last time you were with Khrushchev, Kennedy is informed. Here's what he said and here's what you said. Kennedy said, oh, that's valuable. I need to remember that. If a person is important, it's worth a little running account. You might even have a project book for your children. Here's what's happening between me and my child. We've talked about this and we've talked about this and we've talked about this. Next, a day timer. Keeping track of all of your appointments. You know, mine is all filled with, you know, when to catch an airplane and when to do a seminar, and when to sit down and have a conference, all the rest. Next is a game plan. You know, if you've got a house and the you know, insurance is going to come due and some other things are going to come due, you just put it on a spreadsheet and make sure it's taken care of. Key phrase, take things out of your head and put them on paper. And the key is to just experiment with different ways that helps you to do that. Now here's the last one, thinking on paper and that's to keep a journal. One of the things I'm known for around the world, have been now for 39, 40 years, is keeping a journal. Now my journal is not a, you know, it's not necessarily a, it's not like a diary. It might be part diary. You know, I'm flying over Ireland and I, I write down a few little things that impress me. Uh, today I met this person. Wow, what an extraordinary event. Today, this, I conducted this seminar in Rome. A thousand people stood up and sang for me. I've got a little bit of a diary in there. But here's what primarily your journal is for. Collecting good ideas. A journal is to collect good ideas on your health, good ideas for your business, good ideas for your future, good ideas for time management. Because I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant place mats. And I threw all this stuff in a drawer. It did not serve me well. I finally learned to get a bound copy, right? And just keep a journal, right? If I was here, I had my journal, I'd be taking notes, right? These two days in my journal. Now, if you're caught without your journal, you just take the notes. When you get back home, you put those notes in your journal, throw the paper away. Because we don't usually go through paper to review. But see, my journals now make up a significant part of my own library. My journal's all reserved privately for my children and my grandchildren. Can you imagine what I've collected over the years? It's unbelievable. There are three treasures to leave behind. I think you've already got those notes, right? Here they are. Number one, your pictures. Don't leave the event unrecorded. It takes only a fraction of a, cent, uh, of a second to say, here's who I was with. When I travel the world, we take all these pictures, and here's one of the gifts. People send me the pictures they took of me and them. It's part of the treasures I have on the farm. Incredible. A picture's worth a thousand words to describe the scene, the emotion, what happened. Say, wow, this was an extraordinary day for me when I met these people. Here's what they told me happened to them when they went to my seminar 10 years ago. Wow, the, the drama comes back if you've taken the pictures. It's one of the treasures to leave behind when you go. Remember the old photographs that we have now of, you know, 100 years ago, 70, 80 years ago, just a few photographs? What would it be like if you had thousands of photographs of the past, of your history, your mother, your father, grandparents? So change all of that now for your children. Leave all your photographs as a record. 
here's what's next to leave behind and that's your library the books that changed your life the books that changed your health the books that rescued you from oblivion the books that you passed on to other people they were so exciting for you the books that made you financially independent the books that developed your leadership the books that gave you wisdom to ponder when things were tough the books that got you through the winter the books that helped you to plant in the spring and harvest in the fall what a treasure to leave behind if you do that here's what's for sure your books will be more valuable than your furniture Develop the ability to act, take action. Not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong. That's the time to act. You say, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. See, if you feel strong about that, what you gotta do is get the first book and then get the second book. Before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim, action pronto, action immediate, action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now it's cold. A year from now, it can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. Said, right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process. Fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action, gotta take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. Unless you put it into a disciplined activity. Capture it. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Disciplines. Now, here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Okay. We all pity the man who says, well, this is the only place I let down. Not true. Key to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist, you know, start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal and you won't take pictures and then you won't do this, you won't do wise things with your money, won't do wise things with your time, won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say you have messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Key. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth. Self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline 
and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline. Okay. Let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. And now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited. You'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old way. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The disciplines to do, take action. I recommended the last time I was here, the little book, Richest Man in Babylon, and I said, I've lectured now to over three million people in the last 33 years, and I've recommended this little book to almost all of them, I think. Guess how many have actually gone and got this little book? Answer, very few. My best guess is 10%. Such an easy thing to do. In that last seminar, right, I suggested this little book, number one, is easy to find. Number two, it's easy to buy. The most you can pay for it, six, seven, eight dollars. You can borrow that from your kids. <laughs> and number three, it's easy to read. It's in story form. That's why I use it for teenagers, teaching them how to be rich by 40, 35, if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. But if it's easy to find and easy to buy, and if it's easy to read, why wouldn't everybody go get it? We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. Here's how profound it is. Some do and some don't. Now here's the numbers. About 10% do. 90% don't or won't. We don't know the mystery of that. And I'm telling you, 10 years from now, those numbers will still be the same. 10% will, 90% won't. The numbers don't change. Only the faces change. You're looking at one of the faces. I used to belong to the 90% who couldn't be bothered even if it was easy. Guess how many people have a library card? Wisdom of the world available. Transform your life in any value amount you want. By the way, how much is a library card in Texas? Free, here's what free is, easy. I mean, it can't be any easier than free. Somebody says, well, would you bring it by? Well, no, at least you gotta go get it. No. Wisdom of the world available. Transform your life spiritually, socially, personally, economically, and every other way. Teach you how to be rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many people have a library card? Answer, 3%. 95, 97% couldn't be bothered. Guy specializes in happy hour, but he doesn't have a card. <laughs> and now readily and quickly blames the government and blames his company and blames policy and blames the pay scale. When if he only knew, if he joined the 3%, here's my advice to you today. Walk away from the 97%. Don't talk like they talk. Don't act like they act. Don't go where they go. Don't specialize in what they specialize in. Throw away the blame list they cling to. Start you a new life. You say, well, is it as simple as getting a library card? 
and join the 3%? And the answer is, of course, of course. That's how easy this stuff is. This is so easy, it's so simple, it's not complex. You don't need a 2,000-year-old guru. You don't need multi-track affirmations. I'm telling you, you, don't. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. Key. Don't let somebody sweep you into some contrary way to nature itself, says, unless you labor the miracle of the seed and the soil and the seasons, and God and all the other stuff that's available, sunshine and rain, that's not available to you by affirmation. It is only available to you by labor. So labor well. Okay. Learn well. Discipline yourself well. And you can have all the treasures you want. This stuff's easy and simple. It's not ocean waves and seagulls. You don't have to move to Sedona where all the force fields come together in Arizona. <laughs> Let's teach our kids the simple ways to transform their health, number one, their economics, number two, their ability to communicate, number three, their life and treasure and lifestyle, number four, spirituality, number five, and the list goes on and on. Let's not leave out any of the least of disciplines that encourage us to do the next one, to do the next one, to do the next one. First thing you know, this whole scenario for you is spinning up instead of out of control on the negative side. This is all you got to do. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as a start, committing yourself to life change. And once you start down this road, I promise you, you'll join the 10% and the 3%. We're gonna talk financial independence in just a little while. Guess how many people can retire from the income of their own personal resources when it comes time to retire? Answer, 5%. In the most independent country in the world, 95% are dependent, 5% are independent. Take charge of your own retirement. I'm telling you, if you take charge of your own retirement through personal development and all these skills we've taught today, plus what's coming up, financial independence, I'm telling you, take charge of your own retirement, you can multiply it at least by five, maybe by 10, maybe by 20, maybe by 100. Let the government take care of it, some company take care of it, you got to divide by five. Take charge of your own life, take charge of your own day, take charge of your own conversation, take charge of your own family, take charge of your own possibilities. And learn these skills, develop this kind of strategy, and I'm telling you, life will open up for you. Join the 3%, join the 10%, join the 5%, walk away from the 95%. In our Leadership Weekend we teach, find out what poor people read and don't read it. Don't talk like they talk. Lend a helping hand, but don't fall into the, their poor philosophical scenario. Don't blame what they blame. Don't use the excuses they use. It's called the language of the poor. Switch gears, switch language, switch ideas, switch strategy. Start with the simplest of disciplines. And don't be mean any of these disciplines. The smallest of disciplines starts the process of life change. And if you'll invest in this thing called discipline, you can have whatever you wish. It's called the beginning of miracles. Now here's the last clue on discipline. Do the best you can. We covered earlier, but here's a good scenario for the do the best you can. I've got a good question for you. Is the best you can do all you can do? And the answer is no. Strangely enough, if we all fell on the floor right now and did as many push-ups as we possibly could, and let's say for some reason you haven't been into push-ups lately, I can't imagine why, but let's say... And let's say the best you can do is five. And you look up at the rest of us and say, hey, five is the best I can do. We can tell by the look on your face, that's probably true. Five is the best you can do. Now is five all you can do? The answer is no. If you rest a little, you can do five more. Wow. And if you rest a little, you can do five more. And if you rest a little, you can do 15 more. How did we get from five to 15? It's a miracle. <laughs> and if you rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 20. How did you get from five to 20? It's a miracle. Did you know you can keep doing that? Do a little more, rest a little, do a little more, rest a little, and finally get up to 50 push-ups? Is it possible to get up to 50 push-ups? Of course. How do you go from five to 50? It's a miracle. 
How do you get a miracle going? Number one, do what you can. Don't leave out what you can from writing a letter to your mother in Florida. Start cleaning it all up. Two, doing the push-ups. Go from five to 50. It's a miracle. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here's number three, rest very little. Don't rest too long. Why? The weeds take the garden. Kids have got that figured out. You can't rest too long. Here's the clue. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to act. Think of more disciplines. Think of more ways and means in which to use your own wisdom and your own philosophy and use your own attitude, your own faith, your own courage, your own commitment, your own desires, your own excitement. Invest it, invest it, invest it, invest it in discipline so that it's not wasted. The smallest of discipline. Thereby transform your life. Join the 5%, join the 10%, join the 3%. Guess when I went and got this little book, Richest Man in Babylon? The same day I heard about it. I went and got it. Somebody says, well, Mr. Owen, does that make you different than most other people? And the answer is yes. Somebody says, well, why is that? We don't know. We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. None of us knows. Some do and some don't. The numbers don't change. Only the faces change. From those who get in on a seminar like this, listen to a dynamic sermon, read a book, listen to some cassettes, take seriously the next conversation of a friend who wants to level with you, and do something about it. You can walk away from the 97% and not live there anymore. Because if you don't, the next six years of your life will be like the last six. Mr. Shove said to me, Mr. Rohn, six years now you've been working, I'm telling you the next six years of your life is gonna be like the last six unless you take advantage and start making these personal changes. I made the changes, totally revolutionized my life. So take a look at the next five years of your life. It's gonna be like the last five unless, 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 unless you change. And if you will change, everything will change. Join the 5%. 10 years from now, the numbers are gonna be the same. But I'm telling you, some faces in this audience can change and start showing up in the 3% crowd, in the 5% crowd, in the 10% crowd, and thereby dynamically affect your life and your Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. A new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come but you can change direction immediately. And direction is very important. Discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be. And that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Discipline, those unique steps of intelligent thought and activity that put a lid on temper and a faucet on courtesy, that develop positive and control negative, that encourage success and deter failure, that design lifestyle and control frustration, that enhance health and curb sickness, that promote happiness and manage sadness. Discipline, the start and the continuing process that brings all good things. And remember, anyone can start the process. It's not if I could, I would. It's if I would, I could. If I will, I can. So start the new process. 
you can begin a new habit no matter how small it is. Small isn't important. Whether or not you start and whether or not you continue are all that is important. And don't be deluded by an affirmation. Only affirm what you are truly prepared to do. Many of us delude ourselves with our words into believing that we're making changes and making progress when in fact our daily activity is taking us in the exact opposite direction of our affirmations. Why would you walk in the opposite direction of your dreams? The man dreams of wealth and walks daily towards certain financial disaster. The man wishes for happiness and thinks the thoughts and commits the acts that take him to certain despair. So to have a prosperous life, start a prosperity plan. To become wealthy, start a wealth plan. Remember, you don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. A person with no means can have a rich plan. If you are ill, start a health plan. If you don't have energy, start an energy plan. If you don't feel good, start a feel good plan. If you're not smart, start a smart plan. If you can't, start a can plan. If you haven't, start a have plan. Anyone can. Even a bad person can start hearing good messages and reading good books. Recognize that the start of the better life, the happy life, the wealthy life, is today. This is exciting. Both the process and the result can begin today. Start the new journey today. If you think of a new idea, today is the day to begin the discipline of putting that idea into action. Set this day up as a long, busy, exciting start for your new life. Get your first book for your new library today. Begin your new practice of setting goals today. Start clearing out a drawer of your new orderly desk today. Start eating an apple a day on your new health plan today. Put some money in your new investment for fortune account today. Start reading with intensity for your new wealth of mind plan today. Write a postponed letter today. Make a delayed telephone call today. Pick up your camera and take a picture of something to start your new treasury of photographs today. Get some momentum going on your new commitment to the better life. See how many activities you can pile on in this first day. Go all out. Break away from the negative downward pull of gravity. Start the thrusters going. Prove to yourself that waiting is over, hoping is past, and that faith and action have now taken charge. It's a new day, a new beginning for your new life. With discipline, you can't believe the list of positive moves you can make in the first day of your new beginning. What have you got to lose? Only the despair and fear and guilt of the past. Only the dissatisfaction and unhappiness and lack of fulfillment of the past. You are ready to, as the Bible phrase says, fly with the eagles. And you will have begun your certain journey toward the last key concept we'll discuss on this cassette. Success. Success is both a journey and a destination, isn't it? It is both the steady, measured progress toward a goal and the achievement of a goal. Success is an accomplishment, whether it be great or small. And it's an understanding of the potential and power of an entire human life. Success is an awareness of value, and it's the cultivation of value through discipline. It can be tangible or intangible. Success is a process of turning away from something in order to turn toward something else. From no exercise to exercise, from candy to fruit, from not investing to investing. Success is responding to an invitation, an invitation to change, to grow, to develop, to become to move up to a better place with a better vantage point. But most of all, success is making your life what you want it to be. Considering all the possibilities, considering all the examples, what do you want for your life? That is the big question. Remember, success is not a set of standards from our culture, but rather a collection of personal values clearly defined and ultimately achieved. Success is your better life for you, the design you give it, the dreams you accomplish. 
making your life what you want it to be for you, that is success.